Okay, so uh, a very warm welcome. Uh, thanks everyone for attending today. Uh, looks like we've got some great attendance on the call. Uh, so we're excited to kick off this special webinar between Selden and our partner Snorkel AI. Uh, we'll kick off with some introductions. So uh, my name is Tom Davis. I look after partnerships here at Selden. Uh, I'm also joined by uh, Freya Berg, head of partnerships at Snorkel. Uh, great to be here, Tom. Yeah, thanks Freya. Uh, Algis, who's a solutions engineer at Snorkel. Uh, Andrew, a solutions engineer here at Selden. Um, so on the webinar today, uh, we'd like to cover the following. So we'll begin by outlining some of the common challenges we're seeing uh, preventing companies from achieving AI at scale. Uh, we'll then talk a bit about the Selden and Snorkel partnership and the value we add to customers. Uh, you'll then hear from Algis and Andrew on our data-centric approach to the machine learning lifecycle. Uh, using both Snorkel Flow and Selden Deploy Advanced. Uh, then we'll wrap up and leave some time for Q&A at the end. Uh, so let's kick off with some of the challenges that we're seeing in the market. Uh, so you've all probably seen uh, this statistic or a similar one to this, uh, but the fact is that the majority of AI initiatives never result in real business impact. Uh, so it's one of the most common things that we've heard from both customers and users. Uh, so despite companies investing millions of dollars in AI initiatives, uh, building out highly skilled teams within their companies, uh, and also having more access to uh, more tooling than ever, uh, still most find that the AI efforts are blocked. So why is this the case? Uh, so Freya is going to talk a bit about some of the key blockers uh, we see when organizations are trying to deploy uh, and achieve AI at scale. You bet. So the first challenge most data science teams encounter is just getting the data and having enough labeled training data to train their models. If you think about enterprise data, an enterprise's IP is going to be in its internal data, or at least in the expertise it has to look at that data. And typically the most valuable data is going to be locked in contracts, patient records, maybe call transcripts, email and chat threads. That data is incredibly valuable, but it's unstructured and it's scattered across the company and trying to curate and prepare that data for machine learning is incredibly painful and expensive. Then if most teams are able to pull that data together and build their models, the first deployment into production can be straightforward. But as you start to deploy more models at, in production, running them side by side, doing A-B testing, then you can start to incur a lot of management overhead. Every new model is going to add complexity. And when you have really large models, they can be very difficult and expensive to serve. So let's say you've got that done. The key with uh, AI is it's never a one and done process. Inevitably, you're gonna come up with concept and data drift over time. It's gonna cause degradation in the model's performance. So knowing when to train your, retrain your models and determining how to do it effectively can be incredibly difficult. So next slide. So, you know, I just talked about data being a huge bottleneck. Um, we believe that data is also the biggest opportunity for AI at scale. So what we've seen at Snorkel and what we're seeing across the industry is that organizations are really moving from the old model centric approach where you put a lot of time and effort in trying to have the best possible model and deal with whatever data is out there to more of a data centric reality where the success of a project really depends on the quality of your data. And focusing on improving that quality is key. Now, these kinds of data centric realities require fundamentally new workflows, new technology, new platforms. And that's what the Snorkel team has spent the last seven years working on. With Snorkel Flow, which is our core platform, we've created a programmatic approach to building training data, which is part of a broader data centric AI workflow. And so, what you see on the left side is our unique approach really starts with enabling an enterprise to harness all of the data that it has to use as source of signal. So this could be existing training data, this could be various types of internal data, but it's also the knowledge that their subject matter experts have about how to use that data. It could be knowledge bases and ontologies. It could even be things like foundation models and large language models. So being able to use all of that data to create an initial training data set and then be able to iterate and actively collaborate with internal experts, analyze the data, do guided error analysis, and be able to get better than human accuracy and sometimes a hundred times as fast. That's really the focus of Snorkel. It, but we'll, I'll just we'll go into more details about how it works. I know it sounds a little bit magical. We're not taking humans out. It's still very much a collaborative process, but the key is even once you build your models, 
you still have to be able to get those models into production and manage those models at scale. And that's part of why Snorkel is so excited with this partnership with Selden. So Tom, why don't you talk about how Selden plays in? Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Freya. Um, so operationalizing machine learning, uh, we see, uh, becomes a huge obstacle for organizations. Uh, so one major challenge companies face with machine learning deployment is the significant lead times it takes to get their models into production. So quite often moving from a small number of models uh, to trying to deploy those models at scale uh, brings a whole host of challenges, uh, and these can impact the model performance uh, and also introduce risk into the process. Uh, so at Selden, we focus on the deployment phase of the machine learning lifecycle. Uh, Selden Deploy Advanced is our next generation data-centric MLOps platform, uh, providing a complete solution for the serving, monitoring, and explainability uh, of machine learning models at scale. Uh, so you can serve your models at scale, reducing cost, uh, driving faster time to, uh, value, and accelerating ROI for your business. Uh, alert your team to any unexpected model behavior with advanced monitoring, giving you complete visibility. Um, and also understanding why a model's reached a certain decision uh, is often critical for organizations. Uh, so using Selden, you can get those deeper insights into model behavior uh, with enhanced explainability, uh, and this minimizes the risk and allows you to meet the compliance requirements. Uh, so with Selden Deploy Advanced, you can achieve that true uh, enterprise scale. Uh, so we're very excited about the partnership uh, with Snorkel AI. Uh, so we partnered together to enable companies to scale AI across their business. Uh, and together, Snorkel and Selden help data science teams uh, build an end-to-end -end MLOps workflow that's scalable, uh, accelerating AI development with Snorkel and model deployment with Selden. Uh, auditable, so driving the collaboration between your internal teams and your data scientists. Uh, with Snorkel Flow, you can use data labeling, which can be tracked back to the responsible labeling function. Uh, and this complements Selden's deployment and monitoring capabilities. So you get a clearer understanding and collaboration of your machine learning pipelines across your various team members. Uh, and once the model is in production, uh, Selden can immediately flag any unexpected behavior. This allows you to retrain your models with Snorkel Flow uh, and then serve them back into production using Selden Deploy Advanced. Uh, so now Algis and Andrew are going to talk a bit about our data-centric approach to the machine learning lifecycle uh, using both Snorkel Flow and Selden Deploy Advanced. Lovely. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen if, once I get permission to do it, or if, if someone wants to drive uh, through the slides here, we can do that as well. So what does this look like uh, in practice and how do these two tools connect? Um, let me, I can now share my window. Perfect. Apologies for that, just a little bit of a handover. So what does this look like in practice? Um, when we combine both the tools that Snorkel Flow brings um, to the mix as well as uh, Selden, we're able to do is actually build um, and prototype rapidly where we really focus on the data, uh, which we fir firmly believe is gonna be that thing that drives um, both the increased delivery speed as well as kind of performance for, for any uh, future um, uh, endeavor. So we can ingest data into Snorkel. In Snorkel, we can label our data programmatically, um, train a model kind of in the loop. That is the end artifact that's gonna come out of Snorkel. But as Freya mentioned, because we label our data programmatically, we're able to not just move faster, but also introduce kind of uh, iterability as well as adaptability and really directed kind of error analysis into improving our model. Uh, the model though that then is deployed into Selden, we could use Selden um, to drive uh, many types of model evaluations as well as, as detecting things like data drift, do A-B testing uh, that Andrew will, will talk about. So I'm going to go through and kind of talk about, uh, you know, how do we actually do this in Snorkel? And Andrew will talk about how do we do this in Selden uh, before we jump into uh, demos uh, to, to walk through this end-to-end -end flow on a, um, on, a, on, a, on a simple use case. So the Snorkel development cycle really starts out with a fundamental shift from just manual annotation, where you're going to go through, read through a document, uh, create a label, move on to the next one, rinse, lather, repeat 20,000 times. It's very laborious. It's not fun. Um, oftentimes, it requires deep subject matter expertise. 
uh, which is which is expensive uh, if you can even get a hold of uh, you know subject matter experts to go and label your data. So to shift away from this, what we want to do in Snorkel is instead abstract out those maybe aha moments that you have as you're looking through a particular uh, document, or maybe you're trying to build out a spam classifier uh, that that you want to label as uh, spam or or not spam. Instead of labeling manually, you could actually inject domain knowledge directly. A simple example might be, hey, if I see earn extra cash in the text of the email, that's actually a really powerful signal uh, to um, the model that you're training that, hey, this is actually going to be a spam um, email versus just assigning a manual label. So in Snorkel, what you can do is you could write these labeling functions that essentially organi uh, operationalize uh, and organize all that domain knowledge uh, that you have both in your subject matter experts' heads as well as maybe already codified in your organization. And these labeling functions that I'll show in the demo uh, shortly can take many different forms. They could be manual labels. When you have those, you should use them. Uh, we could also take in subject matter expertise knowledge by looking at patterns or locations of various pieces of text um, within, your, within your data. We could tie into knowledge bases ontologies um, or leverage existing rules-based systems. Or we could also utilize uh, much more advanced techniques like using embedding-based techniques or foundation models to help label our data programmatically. Uh, but the key idea is that uh, not every single labeling function will be perfect and it will not cover all of the, all, all the data that you have. So what do we do when these labeling functions are noisy and precise? And how do we actually uh, uh, collect all of them together to label our data at high quality? And this is, this is the core research that our co-founding team worked on at Stanford. Uh, now our team has, has collaborated on 70 plus papers about many of these techniques. But what we use Snorkel to do, and uh, this all happens kind of behind the hood um, in Snorkel, is that we use these labeling functions. We use a label model that's trained um, kind of uh, in real time in Snorkel to look at agreements and disagreements and denoise our labeling functions. And then we label the data programmatically, and we use that programmatically labeled data to train a model. Uh, this could be something like an open source model, or you could bring in something from Hugging Face, or maybe even like a very custom framework that you've built out in your organization. You could import your own. And what that lets us do is actually train a model very quickly on a large amount of data that's been labeled programmatically. Um, as we go through this process, uh, we can also then identify various buckets of data where we have large um, uh, areas for improvement. Maybe there's uh, data that you just don't have any annotation signal for, or maybe there's some that uh, the annotations are incorrect. So this also allows us to collaborate with our domain experts, where we can, instead of asking them to label hundreds or thousands of documents or data points manually, they can actually just go and look at the edge cases or the most important slivers and really kind of boost the model performance by focusing on the data that's gonna be most in fact, in, impactful. And ultimately, what this lets us do is iterate rapidly, train a model by focusing on the data that's going to be most critical to the model uh, model's performance, select them, and then after we go through many um, iterations uh, or rapid iterations in Snorkel, we can commit the model and deploy it into uh, production uh, that Andrew will talk about um, next. Cool. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Elgis. So. At, at Seldom, we like to say that we help serve, monitor, explain, and manage your machine learning models and assets. So uh, just discussing serving first, uh, it's, it's not just about having a simple endpoint that you can hit uh, to send a request and get a response, but there's so much more that Seldom can really do to support with this. So firstly, using any ML framework that you may have trained your model in, as well as potentially custom wrappers if you need to do something a little bit more complex, we can use either ML server or NVIDIA Triton Inference Server to serve your model. And it's not just about serving models, it might be about serving more complex inference pipelines. So perhaps you have a preprocessor or a post-processor, uh, or maybe you want to string some things together in sort of a log logical way. Um, you might want to do some A-B testing. So in terms of smooth rollout for new versions of your models, you can deploy Canary and Shadow deployment. So we'll see some of that later during the demo. And finally, because we're all based on top of Kubernetes, it makes it very easy to scale those models up to enterprise loads. Uh, Seldon also enables you to then monitor your models. So out of the box, you're going to get um, the monitoring that you might expect. So this is things like you know, the number of requests that have come through, latency, requests per second, um, also your CPU usage, memory usage. So I mean, that's fairly, fairly standard, but 
What Selden also offers, which is beyond what a lot of other people are doing, are uh, sitting on top of our Alibi Detect and Alibi Explain libraries. So with this, you can add more advanced uh, drift detectors, outlier detectors, uh, as well as dashboards on top of that to all understand uh, when you experience drift, you know, perhaps investigating which features drifted and, and then helping you diagnose that issue. There are also dashboards for just looking at inference time, you know, what types of predictions are coming through, what's the distribution of your input features, and you know, is that different from potentially what you trained the data on? Um, if you do have the luxury of ground truth feedback, uh, you can also add dashboards to monitor things like accuracy and precision over time to understand how your model's performing. Uh, but the most important bit is that you can add alerts on top of any of these things so that you know once you go beyond some threshold, it's time to potentially retrain your model using Snorkel. So uh, once you have a model deployed, uh, you might also want to understand why it's making certain predictions. So with Alibi Explain, uh, we have a number of different algorithms you can use to, well, both during training, understand at a global level which features are most important, but at inference time, understanding why a particular prediction was made. So this could help in, in all types of settings, but uh, having a dashboard to understand a particular prediction, um, in the case that Elgus will show, it may be you know, why a certain word contributed to a classification of a document, for example. And finally, with Selden, uh, it's not just about having those deployments available and uh, able to monitor, but enterprises have a lot more needs around things like understanding what models they have in production, being able to discover those uh, and understand what's happening within them. Uh, they also need to smoothly roll things out, but then have the security to know that they can roll back if something goes wrong. And finally, uh, with all sorts of users and teams potentially using the same MLOps platform, it's always important to have things like RBAC in place to uh, control who can read and write certain models and deployments. So uh, that's it at the high level overview for Selden. And I think from here, we're actually gonna jump into a bit of a live demo. So I'll hand back over to Algus uh, to go from here. Lovely. Oh. Thank you, <clears throat> Andrew. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, the, the, the piece of the show that I think everyone's excited about is how does this actually look live and how, what do these two products look like and how do they integrate? So in Storgo, maybe I want to start out just very quickly and highlight um, one thing that I didn't talk about earlier. Uh, what I'll show today is a classification use case, a fairly simple one that we can get done in about 10 minutes. But in Snorkel, we're able to build out classification models across many different document types, including PDFs. We could do multi-label uh, classification for like not mutually exclusive classes as well as building out information extraction, um, either using NER or sequence uh, or candidate-based methods, as well as building over conversational um, uh, use cases. But today what I wanna go through is a quick demo of how do we use Snorkel to programmatically label uh, documents for a classification um, model. So what I'm gonna show here is, is data that I've scraped from the SEC website. So these are kind of legal contracts that we might wanna classify as one to four classes a loan document, a services document, a stock, and employment document. Um, as, you could, as you could think, there's two things to notice here, is that these are legal documents that require some amount of some matter expertise. So you know, asking a lawyer to go through all of these and label them manually might not even happen, or it's gonna be very expensive um, and slow when they could dedicate time. Um, the second thing is you can start to realize if uh, we wanted to expand to even more classes, uh, the pain here is 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 amplified, um, where you even need even deeper kind of expertise to to kind of classify maybe into like 30 different subdomains. And what this could look like is if you're labeling manually, what you're going to basically do is uh, read through the document, kind of either line by line or you're skimming through it, and kind of the human brain will start kind of noticing and connecting dots, right? I like to call these aha moments of, hey, I'm seeing some things that lead me to believe that this is a loan document. I'm going to label this as a loan. And then I'm gonna move on to the next one. Rinse, lather, repeat as you go through and you're kind of playing a game of 20,000 questions to label enough examples for a model to learn. Um, and as, as I've noted, like it's just, it's not a fun process to do. Uh, and also there's a lot of those like really rich moments that you've realized, hey, like I'm noticing things on this document that actually I think are really um, powerful signal of what a particular services document is or a loan document is. So instead of just labeling manually, what you could do in Snorkel instead, you could actually start to codify those aha moments through programmatic labeling functions. 
what that looks like is uh, as a really simple example, maybe I realize that, hey, when I see loan and security agreements in all caps as the first word or first phrase of a document, this is really strong signal that this is a loan document. In Snorkel, I could highlight it and I could click preview LF. And this means preview labeling function. What Snorkel does for me, it, it actually like prepackages this uh, rule or labeling function. And it tries to find similar examples across my entire data set uh, where this pattern exists. I could either review this kind of um, by looking at a couple documents, or I could even use some statistics that Snorkel pulls out for me and say, hey, this is actually a really good um, signal. It's very precise and actually covers 4%, uh, 4 and a quarter percent of my data set. So it's this idea of providing some directional signal of an aha moment that is able to be amplified throughout the entire data set instead of just labeling it once. If I'm happy with this labeling function, Snorkel, I could actually just create this as a labeling function and Snorkel uh, goes and it uh, uh, starts to pull in uh, this initial piece of signal. That's a really simple way of kind of noticing something in a document and then codifying it as a labeling function that could be amplified across my entire data set. Um, I could also do kind of a reverse lookup, maybe like search through my data. Maybe I have domain expertise or one of my subject matter experts on my team said, hey, for uh, uh, services documents, there's this pattern that typically exists because it's uh, legal parlance. Uh, where maybe uh, something starts with like the word this, it might have some uh, text in the middle. So I could use a regular expression to express this and saying, hey, there might be like 50 characters in between. And then uh, the phrase services agreements. Um, assuming I know how to spell, yeah, that looks correct. Um, and I could actually use these labeling functions to search through my data and say, hey, is this a good signal uh, to help me uh, programmatically annotate my data? And it seems like it is. Again, this one's a very precise um, rule, um, you know, exemplified by the, uh, the, the, you know, the specific regex that I wrote. And it also covers about 7% of my data. Um, I could also do the same thing. I could kind of like skim through and take a look at examples, but uh, for the speed, uh, you know, just to move quickly, I'm gonna save this as a labeling function. So I showed two examples. One is that we can kind of identify instances of uh, patterns or aha moments in a document and codify that as a labeling function. Or I might just have domain expertise that I might want to express and say, hey, is this a good um, kind of rule to help me label programmatically? In Snorkel, we have many different labeling functions that we could use. I showed a pattern-based and a um, regex one. We could also use uh, things like looking at uh, keyword counts, locations of keywords, contextualization around keywords, fuzzy matching. If we have numeric data, we could look at maybe like, hey, is the, is the first dollar amount that's mentioned in the document more than $300,000? Um, that might be indicative uh, to me. Um, or I could also use external signal. So I could tie into an existing knowledge base or ontology uh, that might be domain specific or organizational specific. Or I could even tie into an external model. This could be a foundation model, uh, something like GPT-3 or, or like T0++ that we've done with a lot of our customers and help uh, label our data. Realizing that a lot of these external models are not gonna be perfect and I'm gonna solve our whole problem, but we can leverage that uh, signal to help us programmatically annotate our data. Um, two other things that I can do in Snorkel that I think are interesting to show is I could also use suggestions from Snorkel um, for some labeling functions by just kind of selecting some um, suggestions. So in this case, I don't have a labeling function for employment agreements. Um, so I'm gonna accept uh, one of those. And then uh, the other thing that I could also use is one of the more advanced techniques which is using embedding-based clusters. So what you could do in Snorkel is as we create an application, we can create um, embedding-based cl clusters in Snorkel and leverage those as uh, programmatic labeling functions um, as well. I'm just gonna do a quick refresh. I think my, oh, now it shows up after I hit refresh. Um, I think my internet connection is just a little bit shaky. But what we could leverage is, is using kind of embedding-based techniques to look at similarities of data and again, like it might not be perfect, um, but it might provide some directional signal to help us label the data programmatically. So I don't have any uh, annotation signal for, for stocks. Um, so now that my page is refreshing, once that is done, I'm just gonna create a quick uh, cluster uh, labeling function for these stocks. And the, and, and the idea, as, as I'm waiting for this uh, just to quickly um, refresh, is that uh, the labeling functions that I write are in some times, uh, they're gonna be 100% precise. In other ways, they're just gonna be 80, 90, 70%.
all you really have to do is kind of provide directional signal. And as I'll talk through here in a second, Snorkel actually figure out what to do when we're not um, always entirely precise. So now that I have uh, four labeling functions created, uh, two based off patterns, one using a snorkel suggestion, one using kind of an embedding based technique, Snorkel is actually going through and programmatically annotating my data set kind of uh, in the background on the fly. Every single time Snorkel is doing that, it's doing a couple things. One, it's selecting a label model. Um, a lot of the research that our team has worked on, selecting a label model to use, and that label model is being um, uh, used to programmatically label our data uh, when it is confident enough on a particular label. Next thing is we're actually version controlling every single uh, um, loop of this process so that if you always wanna go back or forward, you can do that. So you can start to treat this programmatic annotation um, flow as more like software development than just manual uh, labeling. And then the second thing is I've been training a model kind of here actively in the loop, um, just a quick, fast logistic regression model. But we can train one off of the programmatically labeled data in Snorkel using many different modeling architectures that exist in Snorkel from uh, BERT-based kind of uh, transformers to simpler models. Um, you could do your whole hyperparameter tuning in Snorkel um, as much as you want, or you could use AutoML um, in the loop. The next piece that I want to highlight is because we train a model in the loop and we labeled our data programmatically, we get a lot of signal of where should I spend time next. Um, we have uh, many different tools in Snorkel that a data scientist expects, like a confusion matrix looking at class level matrices. Uh, but the one I want to highlight here really quickly is a clarity matrix. And that allows me to look at the programmatic labels that I generated and the model that I trained and find very prescriptive areas of improvement. So Snorkel will actually give me these buckets and with, uh, with suggestions of where should I spend time. And what I could do is I could actually just drill into these particular buckets um, and Snorkel will actually point me towards the data that I should spend time with directed uh, signal of saying, hey, there's this data that I need to write new labeling functions for. I could, um, if I wanted to, just send this off for um, annotation, for manual annotation, um, if I needed to kind of get my subject matter experts in the loop. Or I might just want to provide a little bit more signal. Snorkel told me to write new labeling functions for these um, 17 examples. So to do that uh, here really quickly, um, I could just write my own. I could explore the data. Um, but to move quickly for this demo, I'm actually just going to use Snorkel suggestions uh, to train a um, quick kind of improved model. So I just kind of accepted a lot of suggestions um, from Snorkel. Um, and now I have a lot more signal. What you can see is that I, I was able to programmatically label about 19,000 um, documents. Uh, you can imagine how long that would take to do manually. And Snorkel actively kind of trains a new um, model in, uh, in the loop. Um, and I can kind of see that incremental improvement. The next piece here is I might actually, in a like if this was a real project, I would iterate several more times using the error analysis, maybe collaborate with my subject matter experts. But like, let's say I'm happy with the model that I'm training. What I could do then uh, before passing it over to Selden is I could kind of train my final model. I'm just going to call it a final model. Let's say I want to train a logistic regression model. Uh, I'm going to train it on um, here fairly quickly. And I could train that. I could also do my kind of uh, some model experimentation in Snorkel. Maybe I want to try an XGBoost model as well as logistic regression model and kind of pass over two models over um, to Selden. I could do that as well. So as this modeling job is uh, finishing up here really quickly, um, just want to kind of reiterate kind of this process that we went through. We use domain expertise to provide uh, programmatic labeling functions using GUI builders in Snorkel. Those programmatic labeling functions were then combined by a label model in Snorkel to label our data set programmatically. Uh, only when the label model is confident enough that there is signal expressed. We use that programmatic label, programmatically labeled data to iterate um, on our data and train a high quality model um, in Snorkel. And, um, and every single part of this process, we're actually version controlling um, this flow so that if we ever needed to go backwards or forwards or provide explainability to the business of, hey, how is a particular data point labeled? Um, through every version, we could actually pull that out of, out of Snorkel. And um, once we have a model selected, what we're able to do is just very simply um, commit a model um, and, 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 and uh, register it to a MLflow registry uh, for, for model deployment. Um, this model should be done training very quickly. 
it's always a uh, nuance of doing ML demos uh, live because models do take a, a quick second um, to train. So uh, our model um, training has completed just on time. And um, you know, I can say that the F1 score here is 95%, 93%. Again, this is a toy problem, but it really shows how you can really quickly drive the performance up by focusing on uh, critical data points, less so kind of doing uh, some hyperparameter tuning on the model itself. So I can um, deploy this model uh, or commit a model. Um, I'm happy with the validation and um, uh, training accuracy of the model. And I could actually go into our application view where you kind of see the end-to-end -end flow with preprocessors or any post-processors we want to create. And I can go and deploy a um, package um, in Snorkel. We could either deploy it locally. Um, we typically use that only for quick sandboxing. But the preferred approach is to actually deploy this as an MLflow package that ties into a registry. So I will deploy this as a Snorkel, um, I'll just call it Snorkel classification model. I'm going to tie into a MLflow registry um, that you could always register to your own and deploy the model. Um, once this model is deployed, I can pass over um, the model and, and pull it out of Selden that Andrew will um, explain how, how this works for any type of canaring, A-B testing, or just model serving uh, drift detection um, going forward. So Andrew, off to you. Thanks, Elgis. Uh, I think the screen share is just gonna switch over to me now. And um, right, let's let's jump in. So you saw the whole development process and, and now we'll discuss a little bit about what deployment looks like in Selden. Um, so, Elgus went ahead and trained up an SK Learn model. Um, he's pushed that over to a ML flow registry. And what we have to do in Selden then is just deploy the, the ML flow model. Now, luckily, Selden with ML Server has uh, an ML flow runtime. And so we'll be using that to deploy this model. So, uh, just to show you, this is Selden Deploy Advanced. This is our enterprise product. And you can see you know, we're in the Selden namespace. We also have a Selden GitOps namespace here just logical groupings of models. Um, and we have a few deployments here, um, just, just to sort of show you for reference. But I'll jump into a, a fresh namespace here, so Selden GitOps, and I'm going to jump in and just create a new deployment in the UI. So I'll walk you through the screen. Um, Selden makes it fairly easy. So we'll, let's just call this uh, snorkel model. We're gonna have it in the Selden GitOps namespace. This is going to be a Selden deployment. Uh, and we'll use the, the V2 protocol. So one thing that Snorkel uh, Selden did across the industry is we invented sort of what we call the open inference protocol, also known as the V2 inference protocol. And what's great about that is it kind of creates a standard for how to move data about your inference graph. So this interoperates really well with other things like KF serving, um, as well as NVIDIA Triton inference server. So uh, we'll use that protocol. And on the next page here, we can pick one of the, the specified runtimes. So a lot of these might look familiar. Uh, like I said, we also have Triton for things that are more you know, deep learning or optimized frameworks. And we also have custom. So if you did want to write your own Python wrapper around some custom code, you could always do that. Uh, in this case, like I said, we'll be using the MLflow runtime. And MLflow in turn supports a number of different frameworks. So there's really lots of flexibility there. Uh, and then what I'm going to point to is just uh, the URI of where this model is located. So I believe this is what it's called. Model. And um, if we did want to configure any kind of secret for security reasons, um, we could do that. But this is a public Google storage bucket, so I can just deploy it right from here. Right. Uh, so we can add some additional parameters in here, environment variables if needed. Um, over here, we can now configure the resource requests and limits. So this is fairly standard Kubernetes stuff. Um, so you, just one thing to note perhaps is that we also have uh, GPU support and Selden is really great about allowing you to actually share GPUs across models. Uh, and so that, so that hopefully saves some money there. So I'm just gonna increase some of the CPU and the memory here as well, just so that the model runs fairly quickly. Um, and then, Next screen, we can actually set up auto scaling. So again, Selden deals mostly with large enterprise customers that are experiencing you know, millions of requests 
a day. And so we have to be able to auto scale up, but also potentially scale down as needed. And uh, finally, you could add things uh, like a pre-processor, post-processor uh, if you wanted to. And because this is all Git ops enabled, which I'll show you what that means in a minute, we can add some additional comments in here and, and then launch the deployment. So you'll see this is syncing in the background. That means that it's basically just looking at the Git repo where I've committed uh, sort of this model manifest to, and then it should start deploying momentarily. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is actually just show you how I went about uh, getting this model, model ready to be created within Selden. So we're gonna jump into a Jupyter notebook uh, for those who are you know, slightly more technical on the call, this might be of interest. Um, but thing to note here is um, anything that I'm showing you within the UI, we can, we can do with the SDK. Uh, and anything that I'm showing you in this notebook, you might wanna actually put into some kind of CI CD pipeline. So maybe you just have a couple steps um, that makes it really easy to deploy from an MLflow regist registry directly into say a staging uh, namespace from Selden. So the first thing uh, we'll do here is just install some additional dependencies. And then what I'm doing is I've created my own Conda environment here called Snorkel. And the Conda file that I used actually came directly from the, the MLflow model. So these are all the dependencies that are needed to, to run the model there. So now that I have my environment set up, I can import just a few additional things that we'll be using. Uh, nothing too crazy here. Sure, things that you've already seen. And now we can jump into just showing you how to wrap your model up using ML server. So uh, for those of you not too familiar with MLflow, it offers a really great way to package your models in a very standardized way. And every MLflow model comes with an ML model file. And this basically tells you what type of flavor the model is. And so that could be scikit-learn, it could be TensorFlow. In this case, it's a Python function. So that gives you sort of unlimited flexibility to define uh, whatever you want. So in Snorkel, you know, there might be some pre-processing functions and, and other things that are happening within the, the code itself. Um, we can actually take a look at the structure of this model here. And, you know, if we want to dive into the code behind it, we can do that. Um, so just to test the model locally, I'm going to use MLflow and the PyFunk flavor, and I'm just going to load this model. So pointing towards uh, the Snorkel model. And again, I have this locally, but this would be sitting in your MLflow registry. Um, so the next thing I'll do is just import some example uh, inference requests. So uh, Algus has provided me with the CSV here of some examples, probably, uh, you know, he had the training set, I have the test set here. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is just pull out the text and URL fields. And from there, uh, just to test the model, you know, I can make a prediction and just make sure that that's running as expected. Okay, so it's returning here, pandas data frame, uh, and you can see, on the right hand side um, that we're getting a prediction that you know, for these three different documents, we have employment, load and services. So uh, that's great and all, we can run it locally, but you know, how would we actually package this up into a microservice with REST and gRPC endpoints so that we can use it uh, within our Kubernetes uh, cluster? So we're gonna use ML server for that, which is an open source tool from Selden. And all ML server needs is basically just a little model settings file. So, you know, I'll create that file here. Um, and so now that we have everything in place, uh, I can essentially go ahead and spin that up. So I'll, I'll do this locally here. I'll just say ML server start dot slash snorkel model and uh, ML server should spin up here. And this will just sort of show you that, you know, on port 8080, we can do rest requests on port 8082, we can do gRPC requests. Okay, so snorkel model looks like it loaded successfully. And what I can now do is essentially send a request. So, you know, we're not just sending a pandas data frame. We have to structure this as the open inference protocol, uh, which I mentioned to you earlier. But uh, handily enough, ML server provides what we call codecs, which allow you to basically convert from something like a pandas data frame or a NumPy array into uh, the request structure that's expected by ML server. And so uh, I'll just create a request here and I've actually just stored it as a JSON file here so I can use it later as well. But now I can actually hit this endpoint here. So on port 8080, I'll run a REST request and just parse that response and yep, 200, okay. Looks like I've got my response. And if I scroll all the way down uh, past the input data, we can see here we're getting these probabilities for the four different classes as well as the, the strings of those actual classes here. 
All right, so uh, we've confirmed now that this is all running locally and that's great, but now we actually wanna put this uh, in a Kubernetes cluster and that's where Seldin comes in. So uh, from here, we can essentially, there's a few different ways that we can package up this environment in a way that uh, Seldin will know how to install all the dependencies. So one way is just to allow it to do it automatically. Um, then you just have to be careful about, you know, Kubernetes not shutting down your pod because it's taking some time to install. Uh, but the other thing you can do is just package up your environment uh, into this, this tar file. So I'm using what we call conda pack, uh, which is Python package to basically take this snorkel conda environment and package it in a way um, that Seldon can use for the deployment. So essentially what I'm doing now is I'm just taking this entire snorkel model uh, folder here which contains everything that we need, uh, including the model settings, the environment, as well as all the ML flow files, uh, and essentially now ready to deploy because I've pushed this all over to a Google storage bucket. So maybe that was a bit uh, long-winded, but hopefully it all made sense. And essentially what I did when I was in Selden Deploy to deploy that model was I, uh, I was just pointing towards this snorkel model folder. Okay. so. Now we'll jump back into the UI uh, and continue on from here. So the snorkel model has been deployed. I'll now jump back into the UI here and I can uh, go ahead and just make a prediction. So I'll go back to that request that I had earlier and let's see if it works. Okay, great. So this model is now online, it's deployed and it's available to be used. So I can uh, run predictions here. So uh, that's great. Let's. Um, Jump back to the dashboard here, and as Helga said, you know you're you're going to be continuously iterating on your model, and and the whole idea here is not that now that your model's deployed, you're done, and you can you know go home and just watch it operate itself for the next couple of years. You actually are going to have this living living breathing machine learning model that will be changing over time, and so of course we offer things to monitor that, like drift detectors, outlier detectors, metric servers, the things I described earlier, um, but. As you're iterating and potentially building new models or testing you know, different architectures side by side, uh, we can do that all in Selden. So what I'm going to do now is add what we call a shadow deployment. Um, and just so you know, the difference between a canary and a shadow is that a canary will take on some percentage of the traffic and uh, a shadow will take on 100% of the traffic, but all the responses will go uh, from the default model. So again, we're using MLflow, even though under the hood it's XGBoost. And uh, I'll just point towards this model. And this is snorkel uh, shadow. Okay, great. So all the screens are fairly similar. So um, I'm just going to add some additional resources here. So this is one GI. And that's all I need basically to, to start this, uh, this shadow up. Okay, so uh, while we're waiting for that to all sync and, and uh, start running, just wanted to show you that we also have this, this notion of the model metadata catalog. So we have two models here that have automatically been created, but you might imagine that you, know, you could have thousands of models in here. And so discoverability is really important. Uh, we can actually edit these fields. So if we did want to do things like add, for example, or, uh, for, for example, who the author is, the Elgus or maybe directly from MLflow, you wanted to add some of your parameters or your metrics. So if this is an F1 score, you, know, you could say 0 0.9. Again, you can do this all programmatically, um, but you likely would do it through some kind of CI/CD pipeline. Okay, so I've edited some metadata, uh, and we'll just scroll down, show you a few additional things uh, here that we can also, you know, as, as this all spins up, start seeing these types of metrics roll through. So requests per second, latency, uh, CPU usage, uh, memory usage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, also, as uh, this is all spinning up, if I'm a data scientist, you know, maybe I don't have direct access to a Kubernetes cluster and I wanna take a look at the logs in here, I can actually check out my pod logs all within the UI. So click on this and I'll just show you maybe just briefly what actually happened and why these models are taking you know, a moment longer to deploy than, than some others is because essentially we're copying that entire environment over to uh, the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and then we're installing all of the dependencies as well. So um, that's a little bit higher up, but all those in, uh, dependencies were installed. Um, 
Okay, so let's take a look. Let's see if this is ready. Okay, so it looks like the shadow has been deployed and we can now run some requests again. I'm just gonna go back and grab this request and create one here. And so what should happen now is that uh, both this request will go to both models side by side. And as these requests are coming through, they will automatically be parsed and logged uh, into our request logger here. So you can take a look at, you know, we've made a number of requests. We can see the input data here, and we can also take a look at and see what this actual prediction was. So in this case, services. Um, if we do want to dig into you know, each individual one, we can take a look here and see that you know, this is the snorkel model container. I'm just moving some things around. Um, but sorry, uh, the predictor, we can look at either the default predictor or the shadow predictor. So we can switch back and forth and take a look to see that you know, in this case, it looks like this is categorized as stock, but in the default case, it was categorized as loan. And today, unfortunately, we're not gonna have enough time to go into some of the more advanced uh, monitoring features, but something like a, dis a feature distribution dashboard or uh, a prediction distribution dashboard would be useful to understand, you know, between your shadow and your default, um, how, how are they performing? Okay, so if I'm comfortable with the way that this shadow deployment is actually working, I can go ahead and promote this to production. So from here, will automatically take this model and 100% of the traffic will start going to the shadow model. Uh, we can actually see all of those changes having happened here in our audit log tab. So uh, each of these deployments is essentially a Kubernetes uh, model manifest and over time that's been changed. So you know, I created the deployment, then I created the shadow uh, and then I promoted the shadow. But if something went wrong and, and the shadow actually was behaving in a very unexpected way and we picked that up, it's always possible to actually go back to SK Learn model. Okay, so we'll add a little comment there. And shortly, we should now go back to our original model, uh, which might take just a second here to sync with the back end. But once it does, we should see that this will switch from snorkel shadow to snorkel model. Um, okay, so it's already done that. And now we're back to our original model here. Right, so uh, unfortunately, that's that's all we have time for. I think in a, in a future session, uh, we will hopefully go through some of the more advanced monitoring. So things like the outlier detectors, drift detectors, uh, model explanations, et cetera. Um, but for now, hopefully that was a useful overview uh, to understand Selden. And I will now hand over to Tom and Freya to finish up. Um, All right, uh, I suppose I can just keep sharing then. Yeah, thanks, uh, and Andrew and Algis, uh, great demo. So uh, just to wrap up, uh, so as you saw uh, during the uh, the demo, uh, so Selden and Snorkel together enable companies to operate, operationalize their data for AI at scale. Um, so working uh, with Snorkel, uh, we can enable data science teams to build an end-to-end -end MLOps workflow uh, to help companies accelerate their AI development with Snorkel, uh, then deploy their models uh, with Selden. Uh, both platforms together uh, fundamentally change how data scientists can collaborate with their internal teams, uh, giving you greater auditability and governance across the entire machine learning lifecycle. Um, and with model guided feedback uh, with Selden, you can uh, flag unexpected behavior and then retrain your models back using Snorkel Flow uh, and then serve these back into production using Selden Deploy, uh, allowing you to change, uh, uh, adapt to changing business requirements. Uh, we have the next slide, Andrew. Um, so if you're interested in finding out more, uh, we've got uh, a whole host of uh, workshops and demos uh, coming up uh, next month, uh, both from Snorkel and Selden. Um, so we'll send out the recording uh, after today. And if you're interested, you can go ahead and register for those. Um, but I think what we'll do now is just la uh, use the last few minutes uh, for any questions that have come up. Um, so maybe Abby, if you want to kind of take over, uh, then we can answer some of the questions from the audience. Of course, yeah, uh, happy to take over on this. Uh, we've got quite a few questions that have come in over the course of the session. Um, thank you very much. Do send any more in if you um, have anything you'd like to ask. 
the first question that we have uh, from uh, Jean-Luc um, is around uh, uh, using um, like an NLP use case, I think. Uh, I think, can everyone see that in the chat? Uh, I think that was one yeah. for you, Al. I can take, yeah, I can take that answer. So yeah, I showed an example of how do we use snorkel programmatic labeling academically known as weak supervision to, for NLP use cases. Uh, just noting that is because we had to choose something to start developing our platform for. We're actively building out our computer vision uh, tooling in Snorkel uh, that we are uh, working through a couple of design partnerships um, with, with a couple uh, of our customers. We'll be doing a more full-fledged um, rollout uh, this year, so stay tuned for that. Uh, but what I can highlight, at least maybe really quickly, is how do we do this and how does this change? Uh, we're here, we were looking at a lot of text patterns or embedding-based kind of patterns. Using for computer vision, uh, what we actually do is we look at feature representations from foundation models. Um, and we use a human in the loop to provide guidance as we go and programmatically label it. Um, again, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's built out. We're working through design partnerships to fine tune our offering there as we're going to be rolling out uh, later this year. So really excited to maybe reach out to us. We, we might be able to set up a demo um, or uh, keep you in the loop and informed as we roll out uh, our computer vision offerings. Cool. Um, great. The next question um, uh, we had was around uh, implementing data quality checks. Um, I think that was in relation to your uh, demo, Algis. Sorry, could you repeat that just one more time? Yeah, so we had um, uh, from Nilifar, he said, um, I joined a bit late, so I'm not sure if you talked about this topic, but he would want to know more about implementing data quality checks. Yeah. Absolutely. I, mean, I think this kind of bridges both products. <clears throat> One of them is, as you're actually going and developing your model, what we oftentimes realize is that you might have corrupted data or superfluous data, or oftentimes even your label schema um, is or your ground truth. It might, it might be even expert, uh, annotated by experts. They might disagree, right? Two physicians might annotate the same um, document differently. So as you go through this loop and you train a model, what you'll start to realize is that because Snorkel points out uh, instances where, of how your data is labeled as well as how the model's performing, you'll start to realize, hey, there's this subset of data that you're going to be spending time and looking at that um, you'll realize, hey, this doesn't really seem right. Um, and like these two documents are very similar or these two medical records are similar, but they're labeled differently by two different experts. This is a really great opportunity to write a labeling function that kind of uh, takes the kind of the joint thinking of how you should label it. And then you can go and apply it through your entire data set. So it's this really data-centric approach by focusing in on those edge cases where we actually see that that's going to inform the model um, the most because your ground truth that you're training, you might originally be training your model on, you know, one is saying this is up and this is down, or this is cancer, this is not cancer. So it's, a, it's this really data-centric uh, development mindset uh, that I think we bring into the mix. And then, um, Andrew, please uh, answer here. But then there's the concept of like actual like concept and data drift as you go into production. If you if you mm -hmm. want to talk to that again, yeah, exactly. So you know you've trained your model. Once it's in production, if it's just an endpoint, it's a black box. You actually have no idea how that model is performing. And so you know having more advanced monitoring, things like drift detectors or outlier detectors. I mean, if say for example uh, you see an outlier, it might be good to go and investigate. You know what what was that point, and is that something that we need to incorporate into our training data set, label it, and retrain our model, or is there actually maybe corrupted data source, and we need, need to think about that. Uh, you might have an explainer on top of that. So maybe you know a, a, a data point came through that hasn't been seen before. You could actually generate an explanation on top of that to figure out, let's say, you know, if it's an image classification model, which segments of that image most contributed to, to that particular prediction. And finally, with data drift, uh, you know, if, if you are seeing over time, say, a batch of 200 requests, uh, comparing it to your training data set, if you're seeing some kind of difference in those distributions you know, using a test statistic, you can start to understand if you are experiencing something like a concept or data drift. Great, thank you both for a very in-depth answers. Um, next question we have is um, from Michael Hoffman. He says, uh, if I can write in Snorkel a labeling function to classify which document is what, why do we need to train an ML model? Yeah. Awesome, awesome, awesome question. And this is a very common one that we get. There's several things. Is one, um, as I explained, these labeling functions very likely don't apply to 100% of your data set. 
And you might start to realize that after you maybe you write labeling functions that can apply to 80, 90% of your data set, um, you're going to be like basically writing these super specific labeling functions to go from 90 to 100 percent. At that point, it might just make sense to like label manually, or you might not even need to because the performance of your model might already be saturated, right? If you think of these concepts of breakout curves, you might have enough data already to train a high performing model. The second thing is my ML models are also able to generalize. So what uh, the machine learning model, like maybe do using a BERT transformer, can actually learn things that a human expert didn't really catch. Um, by looking at these like more intricacies or higher dimensional representations of your data. So here you can kind of combine the both uh, the best of both worlds and you could use a model that is able to generalize. Um, and, and, and you'll typically edge out, maybe like the model will figure out maybe 10%, 20% of the data that a human labeler didn't even, either made mistakes on or didn't label. Um, so it's the concept of generalization for an end model. The last piece is, is that we have these great frameworks for deploying um, open source models. If it's a like fast text from Facebook or a BERT model from Hugging Face um, or Google uh, or using SK Learn packages, we can actually package those up together. And we have these uh, really conducive um, model deployment uh, frameworks that you can go and host the model. So there's a question of servability as well. And then the third piece for enterprise or fourth piece is for enterprises. There's oftentimes already policies around certain types of uh, modeling frameworks that you could use. Um, so the end thing that is already, the end model that we want to deploy is something that people are already used to, as well as has the power of generalizing even past the labeling functions. So there's many advantages to actually training that end model uh, okay. over just using the labeling functions. Uh, that being said, in Snorkel, if you want to just export your labeling functions, you could do that as well. But most of our customers are actually taking the package and uh, deploying it for inference um, uh, through um, an ammo flow, like pushing it to a Selden or uh, or similar. Great. I think we're just coming up to the top of the hour now. I think that's probably all the questions we have time for. Um, thank you everyone for joining us um, for the webinar and thank you to our expert panel. Um, as has been mentioned, we'll be sharing the recording and we'll be in touch um, for anyone who's attended, um, letting you know any of the relevant resources and um, uh, any next steps if you're interested in working with Snoggle or Seldon. Uh, so I hope you'll have a, a good day and um, I think we'll close it up there. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you everybody. Bye. Thanks everyone.